So Tina, while we got you, do you have a question for us? I was thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> she had a question. She forgot it. But that's okay. That is the truth. The question is, what was I going to ask? I don't know what I was going to ask. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. But I just wanted to reaffirm the amazing things that this community gives, brings, and offers for those of us that feel awkward, kind of like the misfit, yep. that we really, that we're alone. We aren't alone. ADHD Rewired episode 261. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we we mention on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. If you're catching this on Tuesday, March 12th, it's the second Tuesday of the month, which means you can join our live Q&A at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. We do this every second Tuesday of the month. Do register for this or future upcoming Q&As. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We have our monthly live Q&A. It is February the 12th. I am sitting, well, not technically next to me, but on my screen is next to me, the co-host <laughs> of our live Q&As and the host of ADHD Essentials, Brendan Mahan. Eric, how are you? I am rocking it, Brendan. I, uh, when you texted me yesterday saying that something about like, not sure if I'm going to make, uh, the, the Q and a, then I see the next test, like stupid winter or something like that. And I was like, didn't see everything. I was like, Oh crap, Brendan can't make the Q and a. And then I actually opened the chat and right where it actually said <laughs> was that you might just be running in right on time, which was great. Yeah. Which is literally what happened. <laughs> I don't know if you, uh, I'm really proud that this, uh, this month I remember to introduce you um, before the break. Cause I don't, I don't know if you remember last month, someone, one of the questions that we had in the chat was, uh, can, can I introduce who you are? Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> my, my pleasure. Uh, other things are going well for you otherwise. Yeah. So what, yeah, what's this I, deal? You're like now a, a school principal. I am you are distracted. What is going on? I'm not. I understand why you feel that way, but that's not what actually happens. Um, so as you know, I do consulting with schools. That's part of my model, which right. is a little different than your model. Right. And one of the schools I've been consulting with them for a little, like almost two years. So somewhere between a little over a year and almost two years, somewhere in that span. And their principal pregnant and said, hey, can you come in? I really hope you have nothing to do with that. I have I nothing to do okay, with that. Okay, no. Not, not, your not wife would be really not cool with that. And no, no. My wife is fantastic. Um, not a problem. So, <laughs> um, so yeah. So, I go in to, to speak with the principal. And, and some of it was like professional development stuff. I've been consulting on some kids. And then she goes, yeah, so I'm pregnant. And I was like, uh-huh. And she was like, I'm going to have to go on a maternity leave in the middle of March. How do you feel about coming in and being the principal while I'm gone. And I said, without missing a beat. So this is evidence that, that I am not distracted. I said, I am really honored that you would request that you would say that. And honestly, it's really tempting and it feels really interesting. And like, I would learn a lot, but my business would die and I just can't do it. Okay. And she went, right. Didn't miss a beat. And so she said, okay, well, would you be willing and open to talk to the board anyway. It's a private school. Would you be willing to talk to the board anyway? Maybe they can figure something out. And I was like, what's like a half an hour, right? So I'm like, okay, it'll be in the evening. I'll, I'm willing to do that. So I sit down with one of the board members and he's like, we understand that you have a business and you can't, you just can't do it because your business would die. What if you were a part-time interim principal 
and we let you meet with clients f- from the school since you do so much work over the internet if necessary. And I was like, um, I mean, that's a lot of accommodating that's that you're sweet. opening up right now. Yeah. So I was like, I could have principal on my resume. And admittedly, the ADHD stuff's going well, but you know, who knows? There might be a day when I have to go back into a school for any reason. So I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I'll do. So it's four hours a day. It means that I now have someone editing my podcast. So that f- helps me find six awesome. hours a day. Right now I have the money to do it. That's awesome. I have Congratulations. That's a big milestone. Thing. Yeah. I have a virtual assistant now too. What's up with that? Um, now I have a reliable income stream so I can do That's that awesome. stuff. Um, and not that my current stuff isn't reliable, but this is a little more reliable. And, and I get to stick principal on my resume. So if for some reason... I have to go back into a school because my wife changes her job, which mm-hmm. is the most likely reason. Um, and I need to be all of a sudden we need health insurance or something. Uh, I t- Tina in the chat uh, asked uh, benefits. No, 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 because I am a um, I'm an hourly employee working off a contract, mm-hmm. so that no benefits, just hourly employee stuff doing. And also, if I can't make it, I can't make it. So if I get a workshop, then I just we have a conversation and. Yeah. I will be doing that workshop. So that kind of stuff. But mm. yeah, I mean, and I also, I get to see if I'm right about some stuff. Interesting. You know what I mean? Like a lot of my workshops and my theories around education and what would be good. Now I'm the leader of a school and I get to, I get to do stuff like, like one of my latest ones is, um, I am no longer a fan of the concept of behavior management. Okay. With, with certain caveats, right? Like, like if you've got, severe autism, then okay, there's some behavior mm-hmm. management happening. Like that I'm with you. But broadly speaking, in a classroom, I don't think it's pay- classroom management is not behavior management. It's emotional management. And if we can get the emotions under control, the kids will take care of the behavior themselves. And behavior just was on the surface. It's about understanding what's right, going exactly. on. Right. Exactly. And so I'm part my first work my first professional development this year with the school was about that very concept, classroom management as emotional management rather than behavior management. And that, I mean, it's like turning the Titanic, right? Like that's a whole, not that these are bad p- teachers because they're not, they're fantastic. They're working really hard, but it's a different philosophical approach. And I get to see what's up with that. So it's pretty exciting. Well, cool. Uh, yeah. I hope that on, uh, we're going to be hearing about it on uh, ADHD Essentials. That's coming. Yeah, that's a thing that will happen. <laughs> I was... I didn't announce it last week because I wanted to get my feet under me. One of the f- things that is fun about this is uh, uh, the plan was I would start March 15th. And then two days after I agreed to do it, um, the principal went in the hospital. And so I started. You way already early. started. I'm already. Oh, I started before Lord. I had a key to well, the building. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Let's let's go ahead and get started and, and answering some people's questions. We have uh, Diana, who has a question about, um, I think, about dyslexia. Nice. Okay. I began to notice at over 50 years old now how I see transposed letters, decimals in the wrong place on first glance. I, I don't think it's acquired. I think it's been there, but I disregard it. I was used to it, I think. And now that I've I'm more self-aware and I'm seeing things to Eric more ways that ADHD objectively interferes with my life. This is starting to become apparent. Then my question is, how is dyslexia diagnosed and can dyslexia be subtle like that? I thought it would be like spilling alphabet soup on the floor and your letters are everywhere, but this is more subtle. Okay. So, um, uh, I will preface by saying I'm not a dyslexia expert, but I have uh, learned more about dyslexia over the years um, through um, one recognizing that I do very similar to what you said. And if you're talking about specifically numbers, that is something that's actually called dyscalculia, which I may or may not be pronouncing correctly. Um, so, uh, it's, you know, which might be because I'm rearranging letters when I read the word. Um, so, and I noticed for me that uh, clearly I had been doing this my whole life, which, you know, makes sense to me why it took me three tries to get through college algebra, twice to get through stats. Um, and it wasn't until I started my own business and started manually entering in credit card numbers that I realized that I am swapping numbers. Like when I read it, I, and I, I have to plug it into something. 
I, and especially if it's a patterned number. So like 5882, I will rewrite it 5822 and I'll do that five times in a row, right? Like, because I had my wife watch what I was doing and she was able to see this uh, particular pattern. So, you know, it may be um, uh, that there's more self-awareness uh, to it. Um, Brendan, I mean, what do you know about as far as like uh, it, it, an age of onset thing? I've never heard that, but I don't know. Um, I know adults who have been diagnosed with dyslexia in adulthood. And it doesn't mean like in, in your case, from what you're describing, it sounds like this has been going on for a while. I think my whole life. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a, it's not necessarily an age of onset thing. It's a lack of awareness or lack of recognition. Yeah. And so as far as like who, how do you get diagnosed? You, uh, a psychologist who does testing, um, is going to be the most, uh, uh, likely place where you can get that diagnosed. Um, so you can get the, the neuro, neuropsych testing, um, they will often do that kind of a, a, of assessment. You can look for places that do educational testing. Uh, if they work with adults, uh, they'll sometimes uh, do that. Um, you know, but I guess the, the greater question is, why do you want the diagnosis? And is that something that is important to you to, to have it for just validation? Or would it be more helpful to come up with strategies that are going to be helpful for, for adaptation, uh, recognizing uh, that, that you have this particular issue? I think the most important thing is strategizing um, for adaptation. But in some ways, we know how illegitimate sometimes ADHD is considered by some people. And especially in a professional... Some people are fools. (laughs) Right. I know they are. I know they're they're wrong. But for some reason, there's more sympathy towards (laughs) dyslexia. And I'm thinking, you know, it just seems more legitimate... um, to have the problems together. And I think, anyway, I've noticed it and that's probably not fair to uh, want to have it, but that's where I'm at. But I think we, we, we want to feel validated for our struggles. So I understand you want to say like, is this a thing? Like, so yeah, I mean, it's, um, we know that co-occurring disorders with ADHD are common and dyslexia is one of those things that comes along with ADHD. And Diana, my, my network extends into dyslexia stuff. Um, yeah. So if you hit a wall, shoot me an email, Brendan okay. at com. I did my first keynote was for a dyslexia group. Say your email again. Brendan, B-R-E-N-D-A-N at ADHD Essentials, E-S-S-E-N-T-I-A-L-S dot com. Yeah, you were right, okay. Brendan. It's too Brendan. long. <laughs> yeah. Brent, Brendan at cool stuff dot com. That's what it should be. <laughs> All right. So then I hope that that helps. And, uh, and I would invite anyone who has additional ideas, who is here at the live Q&A uh, to uh, just put the at symbol um, uh, to Diana in the chat if you have any additional resources for her. All right. Um, Brandon, do you want to uh, uh, go back to the orchard and pick a fresh question? This one's easy. This is from Amy. And it says, don't mind the typos. I won't. I wouldn't even notice them. We're good. She's all set. Um, <laughs> no, Amy is also offering to go live. <laughs> so okay. that's a choice. Hello, Amy. But not my wife. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, hear good. You. This all is right. my first webinar ever. So Awesome. Awesome. So Amy, uh, tell us what your question is. Okay. So I go back and just read what I wrote. Uh, So, well, for me, I'm in my early forties. I was diagnosed with ADHD at 41. So, you know, crazy to struggle with it for so long and not know it. I had gone to a doctor when I was about 20 because I had a client come into the bank and was talking about how ADHD can go into adulthood. And anyway, I went into a doctor, he put me on Ritalin, made me feel terrible. So he told me, if that didn't fix you, then you don't have ADHD. So, you know, the next 20 years, it was like, what's wrong with me? Kind of a thing. Like Mm. it was just a lot of struggle. And my son has ADHD. And so we were sitting in with a psychiatrist through therapy and I'm sitting there going, hello, that's me. Like I'm part of the problem here. And so together we've kind of been working through this. But my question is, as I've tried to get help for myself, I have found 
therapists, even if they say they specialize in ADHD, are, are just not helpful. Like they're really not helpful. And so as I've, you know, I have about a hundred college credits. I want to go back to school or, uh, you know, I, I, I find this desire in me to really help spread the word, to help those that are struggling. I find a lot of women will talk openly about struggles with depression or anxiety, but they will hide ADHD. They hide it. Like they don't want to talk about it. It's an embarrassing kind of thing. There's, uh, you know, I, I really have a desire to help change the perspective on that. But my question is like, what is needed in the world of, of helping those with ADHD as far as, you know, going back to college to get a degree or what does it take to become an ADHD coach? I, I just, I think the help that is being given is, is not all that helpful at this time. So, all right. So, um, what, what I want to do is there's a lot there to unpackage. Um, (laughs) first thing I want to say is I am so sorry to hear that you went 20 years, uh, um, with bad information when your doctor told you, um, that if Ritalin didn't quote unquote, I think fix you was your, your words that yeah. you don't have ADHD. I, I am sorry that you had to live 20 years thinking, uh, thinking that and, uh, and, and struggling. Um, what I want to do, uh, we're going to dive and kind of pull this, this, uh, question apart a bit and get you, get you some help with this. Um, I want to take a quick break. And when we, when we come back, we're going to come back and talk about, uh, what is needed. Uh, so more people are getting, help and what uh what you would might need to do if you want to uh, uh be one of those agents of change that is uh going to go out and help people so you don't have the right. same experience uh so you can help people not have the same experience that that you had Absolutely. all right so uh amy we will be right back This is an ADHD moment of the day posted by one of our Facebook community members that I really just wanted to share with you. ADHD moment of the day. I'm in an elevator with a work contact. He realizes we're not moving because neither of us has pressed the button. I laugh, press the button and say, this is what happens when two people with ADHD get in an elevator. He says, you have ADHD too? Which is the same thing he said the first time I told him about my ADHD. I just love that. If you want to join our Facebook community and join the conversation, go to ADHDrewired.com slash community and fill out a member application. We do screen every member before you are added. We processed our last batch of requests last Wednesday, and we added a new batch of people every few weeks. So if you haven't been on Facebook for a bit and you've been waiting to be added, go check. Again, to become a member of our community, go to ADHDrewired.com slash community. I want to thank everyone who signed up for our spring coaching and accountability groups. Registration has officially ended. We are now full. However, if you are interested in joining our waitlist, go to our website. Go to coachingrewired.com to learn how. Summer sessions are July 8th through September 13th. Details will be announced as soon as I figure them out. Stay tuned for that. All right, we are back. We are answering Amy's question right before the break. Uh, Amy was uh, shared with us that uh, about 20 years ago, she went to see a doctor, tried her on Ritalin. Uh, Doctor said if it didn't help, then you don't have ADHD. So she went 20 years thinking that she didn't have ADHD, didn't get the help, went and uh, her, her kid evaluated and it sounded a lot like her. And so uh, recognizing that um, there was some t- uh, lost time there and uh, you went and saw some specialists, you said, and uh, you're finding that there are specialists who say that they have ADHD or they, they specialize in ADHD, but you're finding that some of the specialists haven't been that special. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So with that sort of frustration, you want to be part of the solution. Absolutely. Okay. So you said you had a hundred cred, uh, college credit hours currently. Yes. So, you know, I've been able to do well in school. It's been a lot of kind of stopping and starting and working and doing it on the side. And, um, 
you know, I, I've kind of really discovered over the years who I am, where my passions lie, where my strengths are. And I've thought of going back to college, maybe in psychology. Um, I guess my question right now is, what is required? I feel like if I don't have those credentials, I don't have the credibility or is it, you know, there's like, I just listened to Russell Barkley's, Dr. Russell Barkley's podcast on the research they have found on life expectancy yeah, with yeah. ADHD. And that was just, that was mind blowing. Yeah. And, you know, so I guess I'm kind of in this place wondering, am I, are there people needed to just get the information out there that we have to get this research out there? Or is it, you know, more beneficial to take the long road, go back psychology, specialize in ADHD? Like, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, what is needed? I don't know what it takes to become an ADHD coach. Okay. So, um, first question is, where are you in life right now? Like, how how old are you? I am 43. Okay. So, I, I, I think that there's still plenty of time to do whatever it is that you want to do. Okay. Um, so... Here's the thing that so I'm I'm trained as a licensed clinical social worker that that is my background. Um, I am of the belief that social work is the original coaching profession because we are the strength based profession. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there whether it's going to get a, a degree in whether it's social work or psychology or counseling, all of these degrees to really do anything with it, you need a master's degree plus uh, plus additional like clinical hours if you want to be able to do any kind of private practice. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're talking about, a, you know, if you have 20 more hours, but another year or two of undergrad plus, uh, plus grad school. Right. Right. So yeah. if that's something you want to do, that it is certainly an option. If you're like, I want to get in the trenches, I want to be helpful. Right. There's, there's a number of things you can do. So first of all, I think it's important to know that the word coach is a non-regulated title. So anybody and their uncle can call themselves a coach, right? Which yeah. is problematic, right? Right, right. I mean, I know that there are coaches who have a problem with me calling myself a coach since I, since I don't have like a, a credentialed coach training. I say it's called a master's degree. Um, that's my perspective. Not everyone agrees with that, but I also have done tons of But it does reading. offer you some credibility. Sure. It does. Sure. So... If you are looking to, to do this, get some credibility and some uh, uh, really sharpen the saw with skills, um, there are different coach training programs out there. Um, I think uh, I was just talking to someone. I think the average um, length of time for a sort of basic uh, level of coach certification, I think, is 18 months. Um, Brendan, I'm not sure what, what do you for because I know that you're sort of in a similar stance as I am as your master's level. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I have two. I have a similar stance. I'm like, I have a master's in ed and a master's in school counseling. I'm qualified. Um, that said, a few things to consider when it comes to coaching. One, it's still re you're still being going through a retraining period, right? Um, and two, for coach training, you're not gonna, you're not going to get student loans. This is why I didn't go the coach training route. I could get student loans for a master's degree in school counseling. I couldn't get student loans for a coaching program. Um, so that, that may or may not play a role. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're feeling like you have some unfinished business with having a hundred credit hours in college. Um, and I, the only reason I asked that question is because you mentioned it. Oh, I do. It's like that thing that hangs over me all yeah. the time that I haven't finished. And so, so that might be a thing you want to pursue. And, and further, um, at the risk of sounding like an improv troupe, yes, and is an option, right? Mm -hmm. You could totally finish those college credits while also doing some coach training. Um, okay. That's an option as well. I don't, I don't think you're ever doing yourself a disservice if you choose to finish a degree, mm -hmm. um, provided you have the money and time. Like I suppose if you don't have that. Yeah, it's so much. It, it, it is just so much to balance with raising right. kids and, and all of your kids. Four to 13. Okay. And when it comes to d making a difference, which is what it sounds like you want to do um, in the ADHD world, there's also parent advocates and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. You don't have to become a coach. That's right. You can become okay. just a, a, a parent support person 
And that can look like anything from finding a, an area mental health facility or, or, or even a DCF program that is or looking Chad, for parents or, or Chad. Yeah. Right. To, to get some training around how to be a parent advocate or, or a parent coach. That's not quite coach training. Um, I think okay. they often still use the word coach, but it's not quite the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a choice. And, and so too is, um, is telling your story, right? Going around to area CPACs, which is a special education PTO kind of thing. Okay. Finding a way to tell your, your story of being a parent with ADHD, potentially of ADHD. I don't know if you do that or not. If your kids have ADHD or not. Oh, no, you, they do. Cause you mentioned that. Uh, yeah. One and possibly a second at this point. So, so that might be part of my world. Yeah, that could be another way to approach it. And and sort of I'm saying maybe you want to dip your toe before you jump in the pool, I guess. Hmm. Um, I mean, are, you, Chad, are you involved with Chad? Just recently. So I, I I mean, just recently. I. All right, so Chad, it's just for, for listeners, just in case you're not familiar with Chad, um, they are the, the largest organization that serves both uh, children and adults with uh, with ADHD. Um, they they have local support groups. They are a national advocacy organization. Uh, they have uh, uh, local conferences. So There's a lot that they do. And one of the, the programs that they offer is a program called uh, Parent to Parent. And they also have one called Teacher to Teacher. And so these are um, evidence-based training programs that are designed so a parent can get trained on how to run these these uh, groups and then can bring it back to their communities uh, to train parents on the, the best practices for behavioral management, for everything around ADHD. Um, so that, that could be an option uh, for you, too. Okay. Okay, great. And having, having taken teacher to teacher, it's phenomenal. I don't know why parent to parent wouldn't also be phenomenal. Great. Okay. Hey, thanks so much for the information. I really appreciate it. And before you go, yeah. um, if you want practice telling your story, you're more than welcome on ADHD Essentials as a guest. All right. <laughs> awesome. Get it out there. Um, okay. so again, Brendan at ADHDessentials.com. I'll throw it in the chat um, if that's something you're interested in doing. Okay. Awesome. Hey, thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Amy. All right. Let's go uh, to another question. Do we have one pulled up yet? Uh, Rob says, at 50, I was just diagnosed. Apparently, I have had it my whole life. I was put on Wellbutrin for the addiction list, but I have new, no clue where to start. Me neither. So where to start, I guess, with ADHD. I'm not questioning anyway. <laughs> yeah, so I'm assuming he means where to start with regard to ADHD. And Does medication line, go live, do we know? It doesn't say go okay. live. Um, but I, I think this backs up Chad. That's a place to start. Mm-hmm. I think you're already here. You're already listening to this podcast and checking this out. That's a, another great place to start. How to ADHD on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, ADHD is a condition that that education around the disorder is helpful, right? It is that that psychoeducational component around learning about ADHD makes a big difference. Yeah, it's it's huge. It's a huge component. Um, and then depending on where you go from there, I, I guess a coach is a choice if you want to head in that direction. Um, if the strategies you've come up with in your own research isn't, aren't quite caught in it. And I think it's important too to say that Wellbutrin uh, is uh, sometimes used as a either adjunct or um, as, a, as an off-label uh, use for ADHD, but it's not, con- it's not considered one of the primary um, uh, medications for ADHD. Um, you know, uh, well, Butrin, uh, dressed up in another name is Zyban, which is an, it's just an anti-smoking, uh, cessation medication, um, which is how I finally quit smoking, you know, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. My doctor said, take this for two months and don't change anything else that you're doing. Don't even try to quit. Uh, and then he said, come back and see me in two months. And he says, all right, let's, let's start working on this now. And I quit with like a few weeks of that. Um, and, and related to that, right. Is seeing the, I was put on Wellbutrin for the addiction list, right? maybe addiction is a thing going on in Rob's life. Maybe it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the possibility that it is, also be looking at the role that ADHD potentially is playing in that addiction because it certainly plays a prominent role in addiction. Yes. Um, assuming that you have ADHD and addiction is a thing you're navigating. And I want to say something too about, and this is something that's really frustrating. Um, and I, I hear... 
this just across across the board, uh, um, across the country with different providers, that uh, someone with ADHD comes in with uh, for help on uh, working through an addiction. And they immediately say, you can't be on your stimulants, like take away the stimulants. And it's a problem because the research actually shows that, yes, as a group, people with ADHD are more likely to, uh, to struggle with addiction. With medication, that decreases, right? Mm-hmm. It's, with medication, it's still higher than the, the, uh, the rest of the, the population, but it decreases the, the risk of, medica- of, of addiction. I mean, think about it. ADHD is an issue of regulating dopamine to the prefrontal cortex. What is, what is addiction? Give me that nice dopamine hit. Give me that nice dopamine hit. Give me that nice dopamine hit. Right. It's, and so the, the stimulant medication can help with that. So it, the struggle is that so many doctors are just afraid to prescribe if they hear of any kind of uh, uh, history of, of addiction. Um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not sure what the solution uh, to that is other than printing out like white papers and bringing it to your doctors. Yeah. Cause we've studies have been done around alcohol and around smoking mm-hmm. and folks with ADHD who are smokers, like the story you just told when they get treated for ADHD by way of medication, they are more successful at quitting smoking. Yeah. They are more successful at getting past the alcohol addiction. So again, like you mentioned, more people with ADHD are Navigating addiction than people who don't have ADHD. But ADHD medication helps us navigate that addiction more effectively. All right. Uh, let's, let's grab another question. And again, if any of you uh, with your questions want to uh, go live, uh, please, uh, please say so. Let's see. Oh, and it looks like Rob did want to go live. I hope that we answered oh. all that, <laughs> that question. Uh, sometimes we're a little late on the uptick here. Uh, but let, let's move to a, to a, new, a new question here. Juliet. All right. That she is happy to go live. So I'm going to find her. All right. Juliet. Hi. How are you going? Hey, Juliet. Welcome. Hey, yeah. Hey, Eric. Hey, Brennan. All right. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I've just put here, I'm looking for strategies to deal with um, the anger component of my ADHD. So especially when it's towards my eight year old boy who also has ADHD. You know that. And I just put here um, in bracket, in, in inverted commas, so I wouldn't forget, um, you know, the three fingers pointing back at me and one at him. So it's all that behavior that I see in him that I know I have in myself that frustrates the hell out of me. Okay. Um, and I just, yeah. All right. So I just want to make sure I, I completely understand, uh, uh, Juliet. So the, the question is not necessarily around just like being angry about having ADHD, but like the anger that's part of the emotional self-regulation that sometimes gets the best of you uh, in this sort of heat of the moment. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, I okay. can go from zero to 10 in, okay. Okay. in two seconds. Yeah. All right. So um, I think the first thing to, to identify is that this is part of ADHD. That, that, you know, it's, it's the, uh, the part of ADHD that is not really discussed, unfortunately. It's because it's not in the DSM, but it is absolutely has always been a part of ADHD, that emotional uh, dysregulation piece. Um, you know, so with, with everything that we look at with uh, how do we best optimize our brain uh, in, the, in the realm of executive functioning, um, you know, so it's going to be things first around self-care. Right. Like, how are you sleeping? Are you eating? Are your, uh, are you, your medications uh, uh, right? Um, stress level. Uh, so like all of those things. So tell us, Juliet, where are you at with that? How's your sleep? Um, my sleep is probably OK to mostly average. Um, yeah. Give us a little bit more um, information about that. <laughs> so. Probably averaging about okay, so maybe it's really shit. It's about four to five hours a night. <laughs> All right, so it's, so it's really shit. It's about four to five hours <laughs> a night. Really okay, yeah. so you know, I know that Julia, you are familiar with the one thing question. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. so we talk about what's the one thing that we could do, such by doing it would make uh, managing our anger easier or necessary. Um, just from hearing about your sleep. I can point uh-huh. to that's going to be a huge, huge bucket. I don't know if you guys uh, caught um, that I was able to, um, I thought fairly well, summarize and retell the question before, from right before the break to when we came back from the break. And that ability to summarize that, which is not something I can always do really well, 
but then I thought I kind of nailed it. This is the sleep. Like this is what sleep does, right? Mm-hmm. And I, because I've been really working on my sleep lately, and I'm doing a pretty good job at it. Um, so I would, I would say, first thing, what can you do for your sleep? What else? Tell me what else do you have going on. Are you exercising? Uh, yeah. So I'm swimming maybe three times a week, and then I'm also getting the kids out for a swim before school some mornings. Okay. Is there any? Do you have any way to increase that? Um. Not at the moment, because I also have my mom okay. in okay. hospital as well, so balancing um, seeing her. Okay. Do you notice that on the days that you exercise, that you're uh, that you're slower to blow up? Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes it, I think part of it also could be that, like when I talked about that behavior, that um, some of those really little things that he does that really frustrate the hell out of me. It's because I'm probably not backing up and doing it myself. So like. Um, being prepared in the morning or forgetting to put me walked out of the house the other day without his shoes on to go to school. Had his socks on. <laughs> but, Brandon, I, I don't know just, about you yeah. as a parent, you know, the things that I get, I know the most frustrated with my son are the things that are totally just remind me of me. Right. And it's like, uh, for me, yeah, those are it. either the things that drive me the craziest or they're the things that I am the most patient yeah, with, yeah. depending on where I am. Mm. Um, and so, a couple of things that I want to play with a little bit. In terms of um, helping to grow your patience a little bit, one exercise that you might want to play with is, um, I call it noticing the green lights. It's really hard. If you imagine driving down the road and trying to count the green lights... It's so hard. All of a sudden you hit a red light and you're like, oh, that's a red light because that stops you. And then you're, you go, I think I just went through like three red lights. I didn't even notice because of or three green lights and I didn't even notice because green lights don't get in the way, but red lights do get in the way. So when we drive down the road, we often think we've hit every single red light on our way to work or on our way home. And that's not the case. We blew through a bunch of greens and didn't see it. So with your kid's behavior, Try to notice the green lights. Try to notice when he's doing the thing you need him to do. When he leaves the house and there's no issue. When he has his shoes on, even if the rest of leaving the house was hard, he had his shoes on. When he's cooperative. The more we pay attention to those behaviors that are positive, and the more we then encourage them and say, hey, thanks for getting your shoes on, or good job getting your homework done today, the more tuned in we become to those aspects of our child's behavior and that grows our patience that grows our connection with our kid if we're mentioning it and and praising those behaviors it increases the likelihood that our child will then engage in those behaviors but if we're mostly addressing the behaviors that don't work we're still reinforcing those behaviors that don't work because now that's where the kid's getting their connection and their attention it's just not the best most most healthy connection and attention but it is much easier to understand because it's so much larger. So it's easier to process for the kid. And Julie, are there certain types of behaviors that are, when we think about um, like antecedent uh, um, training, so the idea of what, what do we know, what's predictable is going to be hard for, uh, you know, for our kid. All right. So for, for my son, um, like he doesn't always respond appropriately to, to certain things. Um, and so like this past weekend, we had a, an issue, um, where he did something that was, uh, he kind of broke some trust. Right. And so when, and what typically happens when he, we get upset, um, and, and rightfully upset, I think it's important for, for kids to see that we do have emotion. Right. Um, then he will respond with anger, which is just like, it just creates this, like this snowball effect. Right. So, um, what, so what I did is I, I went and sat down next to him and I said, all right, I'm going to tell you something. And here is what the expected response. We use the, the language expected and unexpected a lot. It's from uh, Michelle Garcia, winner of social thinking versus appropriate and inappropriate. Uh, Cause that kind of assumes that, you know, the difference. Um, and you know, for some of our kids, they don't always know what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. And um, so I sort of modeled what was expected first. And then I told him what I needed to tell him and it worked beautifully. Right. So same thing if it's like, it's, if it's going to be time to go soon, right? Like 
I it's we're gonna be going in five minutes. When I tell you it's time to go, the expected response is you stop what you're doing and get your shoes. Right. So give him a heads up for transition time. Um, tell him what the expected behavior is, and then cue him. And related to that, just as an example, from my literal right now moment, um, my kids are home from school because we have a half day due to snow. So I just said to them, guys, I need your help. That phrase is key. I need your help. I'm going to be on the internet recording a podcast. I just need you quiet. And they're like, okay. If I had said, guys, you have to be quiet because I'm going to be on a podcast, probably they still would have done it, but there would have been a little resistance in there. We would have maybe had some emotional escalation later, but the phrase, I need your help, you so much mileage out of that phrase. And it can be as simple as, I need your help. We have to leave the house in 10 minutes. So the best way you can help me is by doing X, Y, and Z, shoes, socks, a coat. And I think that the the last thing I want to say about this question, because I want to keep this focus on adults is so we can if we're getting even angry at our our partner um that we're living with you know when we are angry we are stupid as shit like it's just like the things that we say and do is just like our higher level reasoning we don't have access to that when we are angry right Mm. so the best thing we can do and say is nothing walk away from the situation get recovery of your brain uh some quick brain hacks that you can do is drink some water because when you're when you start drinking water that that part of your brain that says oh i must be okay if i'm around the, the water hole i must not be in danger is going to uh decrease the um uh the, the arousal uh anger of your brain um a, a, a dbt strategy is um uh, grabbing an ice cube and just holding it in your hand for 15 20 seconds see if you can uh, sort of just reroute sensation Right, which is uh, kind of what that does, um, and that you know, and have conversations with your kids um, or your your partners. Like when you're in this moment of when you recognize, I don't, you know, I have these big responses. I get angry, and then afterwards, I feel like shit because that's not how I want to be showing up. Right, so let's together. Let's say, well, if I'm getting angry, maybe we can come up with a a, a code word or a signal that says when this happens, I'm gonna go do this. And then, you know, I'll come back in 15 minutes. And uh, so having that sort of like, what can I, that, that sort of recovery plan, that escape route, not that you're avoiding it, but the, it's a, an emergency response kind of situation. Because when we are angry, um, like we're not going to show up in any way that we feel good about uh, how we're showing up. So uh, Juliet, one final thought. And, then it's- and hiding in all of this, Juliet mentioned earlier that she goes from zero to 60. Nobody goes from zero to 60. And, and when mm. we think we go from zero to 60, we get all this extra shame around how I keep going from zero to 60, when in reality, we're probably going from 50 to 60 because I didn't get enough sleep, because I'm not exercising enough, because I'm not paying attention to the good things that my partner or kid are doing, because I'm not recognizing that I'm escalating. So that's, that's in here too, is you're probably not going from zero to 60. So just be a little, try to pay a little more attention to doing some check-ins of where am I at right now? How close to 60 am I? Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Juliet. Thank you. All right. Um, let's transition to our next break. And then when we come back, we'll have some more questions. I want to thank all of our patrons who give each month. We're going to continue to try out new things this year to continue to grow our Patreon community. One of the things that we are doing is that every fourth Tuesday of the month, I'll be hosting a small group strategy session where you can get a bit of coaching around something you've been struggling with. Right now, I am offering this to patrons at the $5 a month level to encourage you to become a patron. Our next patron only strategy session is March 26th at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And that's just a perk. I know that most of our patrons join because they value this podcast, this community, our live Q&As, and everything else we do. If you love ADHD Rewired, show your love by becoming a monthly patron. You can give $1, $5, $10, $20, or $50, or any amount that makes sense to you. Your monthly gift covers the cost of the production team that I use that edits the podcast. They write show notes for every episode and they're timestamps. So it's easy to go back and find something that you heard on the podcast. 
There is so much that we want to do, but we need your help. Help us hit our $800 a month goal so I can offer two $750 a month scholarships for our coaching groups. To become a patron, go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. Welcome back to the monthly ADHD Rewired Q&A. We're about to talk to Brett about being ready for coaching and playing well with others. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Brett, uh, tell us a little bit more uh, about your question here. Good job, Brendan. Did a good job. So I assume you can hear me, right? Yep. 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 Awesome. So I am um, really excited to be a part of this um I was looking for my notes, but really excited to be here. I've learned so much, Eric, already from your podcast. I've listened up to almost a hundred so far. And so, um, but I've already learned uh, a lot. I actually made notes and wrote it down, but now I can't find where it was at. But I learned that was my a, next uh, so question, far. But can you find already the notes? <laughs> was, uh, I know, but can you find the, um, maybe they're in this one. Yeah. So it's like a self advocating, I learned so far, and like uh, read, learn, observe, engage, absorb knowledge about ADHD like just as much as you can. So, and there's tons of other stuff, but my question, I'm 47. I'll just read this here. Uh, happily married for 16 years. I got a bachelor's in math. I thought that would uh, pique your interest, even though with ADHD, I still like math and uh, both my kids take meds. So, you know, been in and out of counseling since I was six, uh, 25 years ago, went through a mental hospital stay. Uh, these days, if I, um, you know, if I tell my story well to someone, this I, in my question, I said Citrus Act. It's actually people kind of like, oh, that's fascinating. So you know, clinicians, people. I have a friend who's a social worker. Uh, people are just kind of uh, fascinated. That's awesome. So anyway, the gist of my question is, uh, you know, I don't really play well with others, and I'm not really sure if I'm ready for a coaching group or if I need to need therapy first to address some of my own. You may not be able to answer this, but do if you know to be able to answer my own individual issues. So, yeah, um, first off, thank you for having the vulnerability to ask that particular question. Um, kudos for, for your vulnerability, self-awareness and uh, um, courage to, to ask that question. So we learned it from watching you, man. <laughs> so thank you. Um, when you when you say you don't play well with others, tell me a little bit more about that. Oh, man. So uh, let's see here again, my notes. So I'm not really sure if I'm a type A guy. Uh, who's like every expression is filtered and controlled and hemmed in by some passive aggressive shell around me, you know, that I've built in. It's the first time I've said that out loud. I was mm. thinking about myself. Um, overall, I'm really clumsy. <laughs> like uh, I break stuff. I can be incredibly skeptical one minute and then incredibly gullible the next. I'm very insecure and uh, make most people with low self-esteem look like they're extremely confident. And uh, I just am driven by fear a lot more than anything else. A nice gift from my, uh, from my family. And so among other things, you know, I'm easily offended. I lock up. I'm not able to process. So like I get in a group, I'm like, oh, Eric didn't call on me till the end of the webinar. <laughs> right. And so I'm like, how do I process that? How so do I there's, it, you know? there's the head junk. I'll, I'll take your word for it. Yeah. Right. So it's those, those negative stories that we tell ourselves, Right. Yeah. So, oh, um, and I was going to, I thought I could, I live in Houston. So I thought, man, I'll even bribe you somehow. And I'll, I, I'll offer to go knock on Brene Brown's door. <laughs> let's, let's talk. About <laughs> All right. So, uh, <laughs> so a couple of things, Brett. So I, I yes, sir. when you were setting up and asking your question, did you think that you came off as sounding insecure? Not sure. No, I hadn't thought about that. Okay. Cause I wanted to give you feedback telling you that you didn't like, I, that was not something that struck me about you at all. Not even a little okay. bit. Right. Not even a little bit, not even on the radar at all. Okay. Yeah. Um, with the challenge, challenges that you said you've had with working with groups, have any of them ever been with a, a group of people who have ADHD? No. Huh? Okay. Nor, nor anyone like you. Uh, I'm from central Illinois and I relate. I feel like I'm a uh, Decatur is where I grew up, Mount okay. Zion, Illinois. Okay. And so I feel like that's part of the connection, just this Midwest thing. Okay. So, you know, I am a huge proponent and, and you know, uh, 
admittedly, I have some bias in here, but here's why I only do group coaching and why I don't do one-on-one work anymore. Okay. Is because I've even done intensive one-on-one coaching with people where I was uh, working with them a couple days a week. Um, so mm-hmm. sort of similar kind of frequency that we have in, in the coaching groups. And, you know, we're, we're working on skill development and we're, you know, uh, there's that accountability piece. And so there is that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when I first started doing my coaching groups, I really wanted it to be a, you know, time management, productivity, let's get shit done, right? Mm-hmm. Like, let's, you know, <laughs> let's save the feelings for therapy, right? We're just focused on getting shit done here. All right, let's, let's, let's go, mm-hmm. let's do this, right? And, uh, you know, I had, that was my plan. But, um, and then, dude, you know, I was in like round three and I was already getting nuked. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So, so that was my original plan. And that was quickly, like clearly not like working, right? Because emotion mm-hmm. is part of this disorder. And mm-hmm. one of the, the things that, um, and here's why I think group works that you're in a group with, with, you know, a dozen or so other people with, with ADHD. And what's happening is you are seeing basically a 12 mirrors of yourself looking back at you. And for the first time, probably in, in your life, there's no judgment looking back. What you're talking about is it's emotional versus like, and that's good. I didn't notice that. I've watched your listen to your podcast and it makes me think like, hey, this is like, I can kind of see the progression, but I didn't see it on the coaching. And so I'm, I've got this kind of uh, like I'm on a project to uh, not at work, but in life to like fix my mentational health. So it's like mental and emotional. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But anyway, so back to you, you're talking about the emotional aspect of coaching. Brendan, go ahead. Well, connected, just connected to what Eric was saying, right? A major component of what Eric's referencing here is safety, right? And when you're talking in a group of people who all have ADHD and have all experienced things pretty similar to you, it's a safer environment. Mm-hmm. And circling back to the beginning of this question, there's a reason you sounded confident and not nervous. Yeah. It's because you know you're with your people and you're mm-hmm. safe here. And so you can be confident because you're secure in the support that this environment has. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that if we had called on you first, mm-hmm. you probably would have come across as more unsure. Because you wouldn't have had a whole bunch of people ahead of you asking questions and showing their vulnerability and and relating to you in a way around ADHD. And I try to, I mean, I do. Um, and I, you know, I tend to be, you know, I used to be quite the oversharer. Uh, and, you know, you, you hone, I, I married an I amazing woman. Like. Uh, it's amazing. one of the fun I mean, things about ADHD groups. It was all oversharers and it's just kind of a norm right. and it's okay. And uh, so the key, like, I, I had a lot of time to process through what I was going to say. So I edited it, thought about it, edited it, thought about it. Um, and, and, and you know, fingers. yeah. So, but I, but that I still think what you're saying about it be, you know, just because uh, I saw Brendan, you and Eric talking at the beginning, and I thought, is that really possible? Like, I can be this happy. So, you know, I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah. I, I, I um. It, it, I think it does start to answer my question. Like, hey, it'd be a safe place. You see mirrors of yourself, um, and there can be some productivity and you know emotional management help from it. Yeah, you know, we have a in my house. We have a little uh, a placard in our kitchen that says Masquer- "Masquerading is normal. Day after day is exhausting." And mm-hmm. you know, here in the community, here in our coaching groups, right? We don't have to masquerade as normal. We can be ourselves, practice stuff, mess up, try again, get positive supportive feedback, right? Where, you know, someone gets called on and then, and then they say, I forgot what I was going to ask. Like <laughs> totally relatable, right? Cause here that's normal, right? <laughs> that so, is normal. Like someone asked me, can you repeat the question that you just asked? And I'm like, does anybody else remember what I just asked? Right. And it's totally like, that's, it's all good. Right. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And when we don't have to spend so much effort at trying to, to masquerade as normal and to, to not be found out, we can actually Mm -hmm. go pretty deep and really start learning and, and growing and, and taking risks, right. That we might not otherwise be able to take. 
Um, you know, that's why I think they, the power of group and just community, you know, that's why it's such a big focus of ADHD rewired is community. Um, because it's, uh, I don't think there's any worse feeling in the world as feeling like you're the only one and that you're all alone. Right. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I, uh, yeah, I, I try to use that regularly now. Uh, masquerading is normal. I like, I've, I've tried to use that. There's a third thing I've learned. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, did you have, was there another one more part of the question? No, no, so, I don't yeah, think so. Sure. I, I did. Normal. <laughs> there was something I, that I didn't write down because I wanted this question to get answered, but Sheila, uh, I'm not sure if she's still on here, but she made a comment about that quote, crazy, great group. And I wondered, I think I knew what she was talking about, but I wanted to see if she could elaborate or if you could elaborate what she meant. It was in the chat and somebody said, you should join this crazy, great group for this reason. And mm. I think she's talking about the community, but I was wondering if you could expand on that. And I just appreciate it, man. I appreciate the show, the podcast, everything. All yeah. Right. I mean, I think the crazy great group is the ADHD rewired community. It's the ADHD rewired coaching groups. It's the ADHD essentials, parent coaching groups. It's the ADHD rewired podcast network. It's this community, right? That's the crazy yeah. great group. We, we support each other. We, we give each other permission to have ADHD when we feel like mm. we're not supposed to be able to have ADHD and like have it. We do. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. That's uh, awesome. No, thank God. I, I appreciate that. Now it was trying to be a segue off of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you Brett, for, your, for your question yes, sir. Uh, and, and how it was helpful. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll see you in a, in a coaching group in, in the near future. Yep. Yep. Just got it. Uh, I appreciate it a lot. Thanks so much guys. Awesome. Thank you. Brett. You uh, I think we have time for one more question. Tina, I caught this one. Not that I want to encourage people to go in the chat, but I caught this one in the chat. So we're going to do a lot of talk. Tina? Am I, am I there yet? You yes. are here. Maybe not all there, Hi. but you are definitely here. Uh, yeah. That's exactly <laughs> what I wanted to talk about. Is there, <laughs> so I'm old. I didn't know I had this until I was old, but it was pretty obvious if you just stepped back and looked. But this community is the only place that I don't use my filter because otherwise I don't look socially normal. <laughs> Never really have. Um, and that's, you know, and that's okay. And I, it was so good to find out that that is, that that's part of how we're, how we're wired or not wired, <laughs> so to say, mm -hmm. you know, um, but really, really finding out more about it and uh, Eric's insights into this and, it's refreshing to get called out on it. Yes, Tina, Tina was in one of our, our coaching groups and then was actually a, one of our volunteer uh, admin helpers uh, in, in one of our coaching groups. And Tina, I remember you would say things like, sorry if I'm you know, saying things that I'm like, no, this is like, this is great. Like we, we love, we love your contribution. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, you know, and, and thank you. And the things that uh, I use, I use what I have gotten out of the coaching groups daily. Because otherwise, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to be ADHD, the 8% of us or whatever the number is that potentially have this. And then we we're out here kind of working in the normal world. So to say, whatever that is, it's fun. So Tina, while we got you, do you have a question for us? I was thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> she had a question. She forgot it, but that's okay. That is the truth. The question is, is, what was I going to ask? I don't know what I was going to ask. I'm sorry, you guys, but I just, I, I just wanted to reaffirm uh, the, the amazing things that this community gives, brings and offers for those of us that feel awkward, kind of like the misfit yep. that we really, that we're alone. We aren't alone. We just aren't alone. Yeah. You know, I think Tina, that we should probably end it here because, uh, you know, this is, doing this, um, you know, when I first started this, uh, thinking about doing these live Q and A's every month. Um, part of my motivation for doing that was like, that's one less guest that I have to schedule. <laughs> yeah. I'm starting to feel that, you know, monthly Q and A. And, but what it's come to be, it's, it's one more way in which community connects uh, here. And it's just, you know, it's so freaking important connecting with, with our tribe. You know, it's, um, it, it never gets old hearing each other's stories and, you know, being able to ask these questions. And, uh, you know, I just feel very, uh, very fortunate to be able to, um, you know, support you guys in the community, be able to answer your questions, to be able to, 
Um, help you guys know that you're not alone, that uh, we might be a bit weird, but there's nothing wrong with you, right? Like, we're a fun bunch, and when we can take a step back, really have some self-compassion, increase our self-awareness, um, and connect, right? We can do hard things. We could do them together. And uh, um, as our, our prior uh, person that we had on, um, which we already forgot his name, and, and that's okay here. Uh, Brett, maybe? Was it Brett? Sure. Yeah, sure. Brett, Brett was on here. Yeah, there was a Brett at some point. Um, right? Like, it's it's all good. And it's a safe space is what Brendan was saying, too. So um, thank you, everyone who asks, uh, who, who joins us. You know, we had, right now we have 30 people who are here just in the live Q&A. I'm, I'm not even sure how many people are watching on uh, on Facebook. Um, oh, two. That was less impressive. Um, <laughs> Let's see who's on the Facebook page, probably because everyone came over here because they actually want to be really connected yeah. Yeah. Uh, to it. So, you know, we do this every second Tuesday of the month, same time, same place. Uh, and if you go to uh, to adhdrewired.com slash events, you can actually click. Uh, I think right now we have five uh, five events posted. So you don't have to remember to go back every month. Just go batch it and it'll go on your calendar. And you'll. Uh, I did that today. So. Yeah. Committed to all of them straight through the summer. <laughs> awesome. I'm missing a private lesson at the dojo to be here. Mm. <laughs> so, Brendan, do you have any questions for me? Um, do you have any questions? That's a solid question. Yeah, I do, actually. Okay. How's the sleep going? And why is the sleep going however it's going? Oh, man. Like, do we have, do we have time for this question? This is... Uh... Oh, no. I don't know how long the answer is. Oh, man. So, um, because mine is crappy now, so I'm hoping that yours is better. <laughs> so, I, I think that I need to do a whole episode on sleep uh, uh, because my sleep since January 1st, so we're recording this February 12th, it'll be out March something, whenever the second Tuesday of the month is out in March, has been better than it has been in my entire adult life. Wow. Yes. That's great. And, you know, this has been something that I've been, you know, for listening to the podcast for a while. And I'm bringing out, you know this about me because I'm always like, how do you always get to bed at nine o'clock? I'm like, teach me your, teach me your secrets. All right. So I've been working on this and struggling with this and making little progress with this for years and years. And it was, it was never for the lack of trying. It was never for the lack of of, you know, eh, it's just not that important. You know, I I've never really throw my hands up in the air and say, oh, I'm just a night owl. Like, you know, cause I know how important it is for me in my life to, to be able to get to bed at, at mm -hmm. a healthy hour for me. Right. Let's do this. Let's get set a time up. You and me, yeah. let's just talk sleep for an hour. Great. Let's do, I think that's a great idea. And then we'll just drop it on both podcasts. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Cause I have, cause I have so many things I want to share about, including what, uh, an yeah. accidental habit that I created around this. Yeah. So let's do that. Cause it's always weird just talking by yourself. At least this way it's a back and forth and, and legitimately we're yin yanging because my sleep is a mess right now. Let's and it's it. because my wife has stuff going on and she's my sleep anchor and she's going to bed earlier than she ordinarily does. And it's messing me up. Oh man. Crumble, crumble, crumble. But we'll talk about it. <laughs> Brendan, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. Um, you can check out Brendan's podcast, ADSC Essentials. It drops every Friday, uh, right? Every Friday? Every Friday. Every Friday. And, uh, you know, thanks for, thanks for being here. If you got value out of the podcast, yeah. please consider becoming a patron. And uh, we'll, we'll catch you next time. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, 
consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week. I want this to be a song about Gibson and Eric Show. But it is a good podcast. Just letting everybody know. ADHD Wired is also good too. It's really good so you subscribe and become a patron when cows go moo. Moo.